know, you look back to 1985 in particular, I mean, we are in a bit of disarray um, for various reasons. We'd, we'd uh, had retirements of a lot of very, very good cricketers. I mean, Lily Chapel Marsh are the obvious ones, but there are hosts of other good cricketers that had retired in that preceding sort of 12, 18 months. And then we had a, a rebel tour of South Africa, uh, which took another 17 cricketers um, out of our system. Uh, a lot of good cricketers too, I mean, uh, particularly in the bowling side of things, um, Alderman, uh, Hogg, Rackerman, um, Stephen Smith was a very good batsman at the time, uh, Mike Hayesman. You know, there's a lot of good cricketers that were taken out of our system. So we were, well, uh, you know, and that was all happened, you know, the announcement leading within the, well, you know, a month leading out from the, the Ashes series that we were heading to in 1985. So, yeah, it was, you know, circumstances um, weren't uh, ideal at the time and um, we got to England. England had a very good side. Uh, Beefy was, uh, you know, in, in the peak, peak of his uh, form in those days. And um, the rest of the England boys, you know, we were just we were out of our class really, but we hung in there reasonably well, but ended up getting beaten in the series. Um, you didn't want to be captain, let's be brutally honest. Um, <laughs> you, Kim Hughes resigned and you were the obvious choice, the best player in the team at the time. Um, but I always thought from the outside looking in, and we have discussed this, that, that you didn't really desperately want to do it. You, you were happy to be a member of a side that was run by a Greg Chappell or someone like that and you just mm. were able to do your bit. Very much so. You know, I hadn't really had any sort of leadership ambitions um, and just the way circumstances uh, pan out, uh, you, you find yourself in this position. And I suppose when you say, look, Kim Hughes is a very good mate of mine and you know, he you know, resigns in tears, you sort of think, well, who'd want to do this job? Um, you know, where, where's the upside, uh, particularly at the time of playing the West Indies? So you're know, sort of thinking, well, you know, you're taking a bit of a poison chalice uh, taking on this role. So, I, look, I was very reluctant and, and it, it did, um, you know, it took me a lot of years to sort of really get to grips with um, being the, the, the boss and being a, a leader, not just a captain, and all those ingredients that go with it. So it probably, you know, through that period um, when I was captain, um, late 84 season, you know, through to that 86-7 um, Ashes loss here in Australia, you know, I, I very reluctantly was doing the job and uh, it, it showed up in, in the way I ran the team, the way the team responded. Um, and so the results weren't coming. We were just talking about that 86-87 um, uh, series. It finished um, here in Melbourne in three days. Uh, so England had uh, uh, re retained the Ashes uh, we'd been beaten just thoroughly in, in the in the test match here, and we we're in the in the change rooms, and everyone's sort of moping around, kicking cans. We, we know we're not playing particularly well, but you know, a couple of beers. Uh, the England boys come into the rooms. We start to get together, and you know it, it, the mood lo loosens up a bit as the two teams, you know, just get together for for a few beers at the at the end of that test match. And as luck would have it, we're watching um, the Davis Cup was on, and Pat Cash was playing. Uh, Michael Pernforce from Sweden. Michael Pernforce yeah. in, the, in the Davis Cup final. And it was on television. And, of course, we're going for Cashy. The, the England boys are going for Pernforce. So it sets up a, you know, another clash uh, in, the, in the change room. So we're watching the tennis, um, enjoying a few beers together. And, of course, Cashy gets up. He's two sets down. It was at Kuyong. Yeah, huge turnaround. Cashy gets up. And there was some, you know, a bit of vibrancy you know in our dressing room about oh Cashy you know he's done it the Aussies have done something today and um, <laughs> but as it turns out Bob Hawke is at the um, Davis Cup and he does the uh, presentation to the Australian team and in his speech and comments he he made reference to he said and it's a pity there wasn't 11 Pat Cashers at uh, the MCG today <laughs> oh the cans and rubbish that got thrown at the TV <laughs> from that point. But, it, look, it was a fair comment and we had to cop it on the chin. And I can remember there was a group of uh, the Aussie boys, you know, Booney and, and Jeff Marsh and myself, uh, Stephen War, a couple of others. So we went up into Ian McDonald's room, uh, who was our manager at the time. And we just had this, um, you know, really heart-to-heart -heart sort of powwow about, you know, drawing a line in the sand. That's it. That's as bad as we can get. We're going to sort of turn things around from here and, and to me that particular afternoon was uh, you know, a bit of a watershed as far as getting things to go the other way. Let's talk about your, your Ashes highlight and not taking the 1989, I know we're going to get some vision up on the screen of it, the 1989 team to England, written off by many as arguably the worst team we've ever sent 
And for <laughs> Zip later, yeah. uh, you were able to captain an unbelievably good team to an Ashes victory. Oh, look, that, that uh, as I've said, it's, that's the, you know, of all the, the cricket I've played, that particular period, uh, 89 Ashes, uh, is my favourite uh, period of cricket. Um, we were underrated, underestimated, really, um, arriving in England. There was headlines, you know, to that point, uh, JB, about worst, possibly the worst team ever, etc. So it wasn't hard for me to, to motivate the troops. Um, the, the tour was destined for greatness because uh, David Byrne had beaten the uh, drinking record between Sydney and London, 52 <laughs> cans. So, you know, it could only get better from there. You know, it was just a, a fantastic start to what was a, what was a, a golden yep. um, series. I mean, we had a... It's just amazing. You had a collection of blokes together, uh, all gelled straight away. Um, and it just sort of... Everything we touched started to turn to gold. I mean, not dissimilar to what's happening now with um, the Aussie boys. And we, we went to England to those headlines that they've received. Uh, didn't do well in the one-day uh, tournament, I don't think, leading up into that Ashes yep. series. And then all of a sudden, things started to turn around. And uh, so it was, um, yeah, just, just special times. Uh, I can't quite see the, the screen up there, but it was just... Terry Alderman was just unbelievable. You know, he's a guy that's... He was born to bowl in England, basically. I mean, he did quite well in other parts of the world, but yep. particularly England. Um, you know, he had two series uh, in England and both resulted in 40-plus wickets. Yep. You know, that, that's just extraordinary return. So the attack led by Alderman, um, and then we had good backup with uh, Jeff Lawson, and then, of course, uh, the big fella, Big Swerven. Um, he was our enforcer, um, you know, ugly man to face. And, um, you know, just always bowling bounces and in your ear and chirping away and just, you know, very uncomfortable. Made life batting very uncomfortable. And we end up having Trevor Hones, who, who'd done very well um, in that tour of South Africa. And it really improved as a cricketer. And uh, he was our sort of leg spinner. So it, it just all combined so well. David Boone getting to 52 cans between <laughs> Sydney Airport and um, Heathrow. you have any role in that, Alan? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no, I was one of the uh, early pace setters. You know, like those mile runs when they're trying to break the, the world record. <laughs> I lasted about 150 metres. <laughs> uh, I, I've got to about a dozen cans. That was the end of me. I was gone. But um, Terry Alderman, um, very, very solid performer. But I think he got to about 30. That, we had pace setters because you can't get to 52 cans just on your own, you know. <laughs> So, Terry Alderman, you know, he got to about 30, and he, there was various uh, uh, people who joined David throughout the, uh, <laughs> throughout the flight, and um, yeah, it was uh, quite extraordinary. Um, I can remember we, we get, get to London, and uh, you get in the, very early in the morning, and straight away we've got to uh, get to the team hotel, the Westbury Hotel in London, get to get into our number ones. And we go and meet the press basically straight away. So it's about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning by the time this is happening. And so we're in a, a, a small room, a table, and the management team are there. There's myself, Bob Simpson, Laurie Saw is the team manager. And my job is basically just to introduce the 39th uh, Ashes uh, touring team, uh, my vice-captain, Jeff Marsh, and, and give a bit of a spiel on the vice-captain. He comes and stands on stage behind me, and I go through the players. So, of course, I've done three or four, and then all of a sudden, uh-oh, there he is. <laughs> the keg on legs. And I introduced David Byrne, trying to make a bit light of it, and he sort of staggers out. He's holding it together unbelievably well, but he comes and stands right behind me, and he starts pulling my hair and sticking his finger in my ear, tugging on my jacket. So I, I had to word up uh, big Tom Moody was next in to sort of uh, grab Booney and he sort of got him in a bit of a uh, nice hard lock and sort of kept him under wraps. Till we, so he survived through the press conference. Anyway, Bob Simpson by this stage, he's got wind of what's happened and uh, David <laughs> in my room want to see you and uh, he gets a, a massive tongue lashing and uh, we then convene a bit of a team meeting um, uh, Simo just wanted to sort of set the record straight about, you know, wasn't, wasn't happy with what had happened um, and he wants to keep this totally in-house. No one's to say a word. <laughs> and just on that phrase, up goes a hand from the back of the room. It's Mervyn Hughes. He said, oh, Simo, I might have let the cat out of the bag. 
I've just been on to Radio 3AW talking about the record that Bernie's just made. <laughs> Simo was not impressed. Hey, a couple of things we need to discuss. We'll get to the Ashes coming up in just a sec, but your great mate, Sir Ian Botham, I think you first played against each other in 1978 in your first test and then proceeded to play against each other for 15 years and with each other a bit as well, but became great friends in, uh, during that journey. What was it about Beefy as an opponent that made him so special? Well, I mean, quality opponent. Uh, when you've uh, got the, the skills he had, um, you know, coming at number six, very, very dangerous when in that mood. Um, he could just take the game away from you that you could see, you know, we've seen quite a few times um, throughout his time. He seemed to save his best for Australia, mind. Um, with the new ball or old ball, very competitive, um, got wickets um, and was a handy uh, second slipper. Mm. I don't know how many catches you took beef. It was 120-odd catches and, you know, just fantastic fielder. So, you know, the whole package that he brings to the table is, you know, very special. But